As I mentioned, some members have opted to use secure video teleconferencing, which allows them to participate remotely. For those on video conference, once you start speaking, there will be a slight delay before you are displayed on the main screen as I am now. To minimize background noise, we ask that the members who are participating virtually remain on mute until it is your turn to ask questions. Please remember to mute yourself at the conclusion of your question. Should you seek additional time, please unmute mute yourself so that I may recognize you. Just like if you were in the room and you want to get uh, the chair's attention, you know, you would turn your mic on and, and ask for attention. Uh, for those participating remotely, your voice will actually activate your appearing on the screen across the room. So just know that, uh, that it doesn't go on. You don't move to the screen until, uh, until you actually begin speaking. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there is a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will retain the balance of your time. For members using the video option, you will notice a clock on the bottom of your screen that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn to yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time is almost expired. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. In terms of the speaking order, we will follow the order set forth in the House rules, beginning with the chair and ranking member, then members present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized in order of seniority, and finally members at the time the hearing is called to order. Today's hearing is on VA's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Again, we welcome the, Secretary, the Department of Veterans Affairs Secretary Robert Wilkie, who is joined by Dr. Paul Lawrence, the Undersecretary for Benefits at the Veterans Benefits of Administration, Mr. John Rachowski, the Assistant Secretary for Management and Chief Financial Officer, and Dr. Jennifer McDonald, Chief Consultant to the Deputy Undersecretary for Health. Thank you all for being here today. I cannot underscore enough the importance of this hearing as we strive to take care of our veterans and do everything in our power to keep our frontline healthcare workers safe. This hearing is an important opportunity to provide oversight of the almost $20 billion Congress has appropriated to VA in emergency funding in the Families First Coronavirus Response Act and the CARES Act to assist VA in combating the pandemic. The bulk of the funding we have provided, $14.5 billion, is for direct patient care. And it is our duty to oversee that funding to ensure that VA is administering and veterans are receiving the utmost and highest quality of care, especially during these unprecedented times. With that money, we expect VA to provide enough personal protective equipment, or PPE, to every single person working in a VHA facility and to their patients when necessary. As soon as one COVID positive patient walks through the door of a VA facility, every VA employee working there is at risk for contracting the virus, whether they are directly treating the patient in the COVID-19 ward or not. I understand the shortage of supplies and unstable supply chain issues contributed to VA's implementation of austerity measures for providing PPE, but only providing PPE to frontline VA healthcare workers, particularly only those who were treating directly COVID-19 patients was unacceptable especially given the amount of interaction other VA employees have with patients who may or may not display symptoms of the virus. And we all know and are well aware that you do not have to be symptomatic in order to be carrying the virus. I am glad that VA has started to make steps in the right direction after unrelenting backlash from Congress on the irresponsible PPE policy and has since updated it to reflect the need to provide one mask for every employee, regardless of direct patient interaction or not. And I appreciated the opportunity, Mr. Secretary, to, uh, to talk with you throughout this crisis, uh, express our concerns, and also get feedback from you on how we could be helpful to you in making sure that we could right that ship. However, despite this being the policy on paper, I am still hearing concerns at the field level that it is not being implemented consistently, so many veterans and employees are still left unprotected. VA must make sure it is communicating effectively. It is not enough to issue guidance regarding the health and safety of veterans and VA employees, VA must ensure that such guidance is being adhered to and implemented consistently. Further, VA must do everything in its power to meet conventional CDC standards in PPE usage. Any austerity or contingency measure in place on PPE usage leaves veterans and healthcare workers vulnerable to infection. This is especially egregious when the president has it within his full authority to fix the problem of a lack of supplies and PPE by fully invoking the Defense Protection Act so that American businesses can completely fill the gap in the supply chain for these vital resources, which is the Defense Production Act's purpose. 
VA would no longer have to compete for scarce supplies like it currently does, and VA could revert back to conventional practices rather than austerity measures in administering PPE. Further exacerbating the problem, scarce resources create the ripe conditions for price gouging, which many companies are taking advantage of. A ProPublica piece published a couple of weeks ago shed light on the issue of small, inexperienced contractors charging exorbitant prices for, PPE, for scarce PPE, and VA agreeing to pay that price because of how desperate the situation was. I understand these are unprecedented times, but we need to do everything we can to protect our veterans and our frontline healthcare workers who are putting their lives at risk to combat this deadly virus while still protecting taxpayer dollars to do so. Additionally, within the funding Congress appropriated, we also want to make sure that VA is providing adequate testing to veterans and also to its employees. I cannot stress enough the importance of testing, as it will be the only way we can get a handle on how the virus is spreading and where. We need adequate testing to make Americans feel safe. We do not have a consistent, comprehensive testing policy at VA right now, and that must change. This is especially important as VA makes the decision to reopen its facilities around the country beyond emergency and urgent care. VA has already begun reopening at 20 facilities and plans to reopen additional facilities and start to resume more services in a phased process. We need to make sure that we have sound policies in place so we don't spike, see spikes in the virus as we move forward. Lastly, when veterans are at VA hospitals, we need to make sure they are being treated with the utmost quality of care. More and more information is coming out about how ineffective and potentially deadly the anti-malarial drug hydroxychloroquine is to COVID positive patients. What is astounding to me is VA is still insisting on providing this drug to veterans, yet VA cannot effectively communicate the circumstances in which the, the drug is administered. We, I hope that changes today. We clearly have a lot of ground to cover today. Thank you all for being here this morning, and I look forward to your testimony, Mr. Secretary. At this time, I'd like to yield to my ranking member, Judge Carter, for his opening statement. And please note there may be a delay before he is displayed on the main screen. Judge Carter. Good morning from Round Rock, Texas. And Chairman, thank you for this hearing today. Just to let you know that right now it's 67 degrees outside in the Lone Star State. Temperature is going to be up around 85 today, which is kind of cool for us. Uh, I'm really glad to be here today. I never thought I'd be holding a hearing uh, sitting in my home uh, telecommunicating. This is quite, quite, a, quite a step. This hearing is a big step for the Appropriations Committee and the House of Representatives and a first step. So I'm proud to be part of it. I congratulate Chairwoman Lowy, and Ranking Member Granger uh, for their leadership in this. And I'm very proud of our subcommittee chairwoman who has been working very hard to get this done right. And I thank all of them and congratulate them for their work. Uh, you cannot attend this hearing uh, in, in person, I guess uh, this is the best I'm going to be able to do, and I'm grateful for it. This will help us all uh, as we continue with our oversight of the Department of Veterans Affairs, especially its response to COVID-19 and the use of supplemental funding provided just two months ago. Secretary Wilkie, thank you for being here to talk with us about the VA's response to COVID-19. In many ways, the VA has been at the forefront of America's response and has been a leader in caring for those affected by the pandemic. VA's quick and decisive actions to protect residents in community living centers and other special care facilities, such as spinal cord injury units, spared many veterans serious injury uh, and, or illness and possible death. VA has also stepped up a system and as individual employees, they work to help civilians. It provided urgent need for doctors, nurses, beds, equipment, and medicine in every corner of the United States. Uh, in the past, not, uh, not many would have believed that a large decentralized national healthcare system could so quickly and effectively respond, but the VA did, never losing focus on their first mission, 
which is care for our veterans. VA has some problems, such as finding and maintaining supplies of personal protective equipment for its employees and questionable con uh, contracting procedures, and we'll discuss these issues today. We also need to discuss the supplemental funding provided by the CARES Act and whether there is a need for additional funding in, uh, in the, any, any follow-in or follow-up package that may be coming in future years. In closing, I want to thank the committee's technology staff and the House Recording Studio for their very diligent work. We are holding this hearing today because of your know-how and willingness to help us learn. And I personally thank you. Madam Chair, thank you again for yielding my, me this time, and I yield back. Thank you, Judge Carter, and I, I appreciate your kind words and join you in thanking uh, our appropriation staff as well as the technology staff and the House Recording Studio. Um, this is one of the, um, outside of the Rules Committee, uh, the first with um, outside witness hearings, uh, outside witness hybrid hearings where we have some members participating remotely and some in person. And, uh, there, there was lots of rehearsal, dress rehearsals uh, that went into this and to make sure that everything was gonna go smoothly. And I thank all of the members uh, for their cooperation. And uh, uh, you know, this, that's, that's the spirit of this committee. It always has been, and uh, it's, it's deeply appreciated so that we can continue to do the work that is so important for us to do. Um, Judge Carter, thank you for your uh, thoughtful remarks. Now I'd like to yield to the full committee uh, chair uh, Congresswoman Nita Lowy for her opening remarks. And again, there might be a slight delay uh, before she appears on the screen. Madam Chair, you're recognized. I thank Chairwoman Wasserman Schultz and Ranking Member Carter for holding this very important hearing. And I welcome Secretary Wilkie and our other distinguished officials. And I thank our committee staff for navigating this new way of conducting business. Before we begin our discussion on the heels of Memorial Day, we would be remiss not to mention our recent calls for the removal of Nazi headstones in some of our cemeteries. Although predecessors may have allowed them, today we need to do the right thing and remove these offensive symbols from the solemn ground where our brave warriors rest. During this horrible corona crisis, our responsibility to the men and women who have served our country has never been more vital. This administration's lack of preparedness and mismanagement has led to needless death and suffering and much fear among veterans, their families and the healthcare professionals who care for them. To date, there have been more than 13,500 cases of COVID-19 diagnosed throughout VA healthcare facilities. Of the 1,193 tragic deaths, 241 have occurred in New York. The situation and even more tragic in state-run veterans' homes, where our most vulnerable veterans have been denied the highest quality of care. The VA has a responsibility to oversee and ensure the facilities are meeting VA standards of care, and VA should have stepped in sooner to help. For nearly three months, the VA healthcare workers have risked their lives and the lives of patients because of a shortage of personal protective equipment. The lack of urgency by the VA to address this need has likely contributed to additional sickness and death. 
I do hope that we are all on the same page and that we can work to fix this issue, which is so outrageous. Veterans have suffered because of disruption to routine physical and mental health care visits. Many face the stress and burden of unemployment, homelessness, and uncertainty. And at a time when veterans most need the VA to be ahead of the curve, it is falling behind. We need to understand what went wrong, why then we can understand and identify what needs to be done to avoid this shameful treatment of veterans in the future. So thank you. I look forward to your statement. And I do look forward to answers to our questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate your thoughtful remarks. Mr. Secretary, as always, uh, your full statement will be entered into the record, and you are recognized to summarize your remarks for five minutes. Well, thank you very much. And, and I want to thank you also for uh, your availability to me throughout this. Um, I value that relationship, and I think it is incredibly important uh, to the department. You know, we are fighting a war that very few people in America would have predicted just a few months ago. Our doctors, nurses, and staff are routinely putting their lives on the line and sacrificing time with their families to care for veterans, most of whom are older and are therefore more vulnerable to this virus. 31 of our staff members have passed away, and as you know, we have lost hundreds of veterans to this disease. Uh, but the news is not all grim. From the start, VA took an aggressive posture to protect our patients from COVID-19, and our staff has worked tirelessly to carry it out with great success. Here is where we stand. We have diagnosed 11,500 veterans with the virus, but over 9,000 of them have fully recovered. That is 76%. Today, we are only treating 1,500 veterans for the virus out of the over 9.2 million veterans who are in our system. We are stocked with supplies. On average, VHA has a minimum of two weeks supply on hand of each type of PPE gloves, eye protection, masks, gowns, and sanitizer. We are staffed in part because of the changes that we have made in our hiring processes. In the last five weeks, we have hired more than 10,000 medical staff, including 3,000 nurses. And as I discussed with the chair yesterday, uh, I intend to keep these processes in place. If I need to come for a legislative fix, uh, I will be doing so uh, after consultation with you. Our infection rate among VA staff, I can argue, is the lowest of any healthcare system in the country. It is either at half of 1% or lower. And I credit the steps that we took early on to protect those on the front lines with these incredibly low numbers. We were the first healthcare system and the first federal agency to activate our emergency procedures. We did so in January, establishing 19 emergency operations centers across the country. We did begin to manage our supplies of PPE, and as I have been candid with the chair, our, our regular supply chain was disrupted by this national emergency, and we have changed to meet that emergency. In some ways, we have stressed the system, which I think will be better for the future. Telehealth services have expanded exponentially. Uh, in a normal month, uh, we would conduct 40,000 mental health televisits. We are now at 900,000. We are reaching areas of the country that we never thought we would reach, particularly in tribal and rural America. Um, this is a game changer, particularly when it comes to mental health. In April, we began working our fourth mission in earnest, taking in non-veterans in hotspots and deploying VA staff to nursing homes and state veterans' homes that needed our expertise, an issue I know some of you will want to talk about today. In addition, we have our Veterans Benefits Administration has reached out to more than 400,000 veterans and continuing to talk about our response and answer questions about their benefits during the crisis. Our National Cemetery Administration has taken steps to ensure that loved ones 
are interred. In yeah, there, there isn't a decent question there because he answered them, but Madam I also Chair, think it's- Madam Chair, you need to mute your line. Okay. Secretary, Ms. Sec you can resume. That our veterans are interred in a Mr. Secretary, you can proceed. I'm just going to make okay. sure we have it. The okay. Te technical issue. Ahead? Please I'll proceed. Just, um, I'll, I'll just divert to, I, um, I was privileged to address several veterans at the Quantico National Cemetery on Memorial Day. And as I was looking out down the hill, I saw veterans' families uh, gathering on that day to pay their respects to their loved ones. Our veterans' cemeteries have never closed. Our hospitals have never closed. Uh, at the end, I believe that our people have turned VA into a learning organization that was able to turn on a dime in this crisis and transform itself from an institution that many of us has, have known and some of us have looked askance at for many years. Uh, I can't thank them enough for their agility. I can't thank them enough for putting themselves in harm's way to serve their fellow Americans, and I thank you. Madam Chair, for allowing me to speak. Thank, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Ms., uh, now I'd like to, uh, to, to begin uh, my uh, five minutes of questions. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to start off this hearing discussing the issue of personal protective equipment, or PPE, which I noted has been a huge issue for the VA. Um, as of yesterday, VA has, ha has about a 39-day supply of gloves, a 333-day supply of face shields, a 267-day supply of N95 masks, 244-day supply of generic and surgical masks, and about a 50-day supply of gowns. This is a significant improvement from VA's earlier days in combating the coronavirus pandemic when it had 18 days or less of all supplies, leading to VA evoking auster austerity measures on VHA employees' use of PPE. Per CDC guidance, as PPP, PPE availability returns to normal, Healthcare facilities should promptly resume standard practices. Now that VA has significantly higher amounts of PPE, does VA plan to issue any additional, less stringent guidance to the field to, protect, to further protect veterans and healthcare workers? And would you please clarify for the record what VA's guidance is regarding who receives PPE and under what circumstances they receive it, including veterans, frontline healthcare I'll workers, answer. and all other employees in the VA facilities? Um, I um, let the practitioner give you the, the, the chapter and verse on what the medical needs are. I will say that our hospitals have never run out of equipment. Uh, but in response to this emergency, as you and I discussed yesterday, uh, we are putting in place plans and operations so that uh, we do not have to adjust to a disruption in the supply chain. Uh, I have given instructions to begin the establishment of depots across the country uh, to supply, to, to, to house uh, PPE and, and other medical equipment so that if this does Mr. rebound. Mr. Secretary, I want to be uh, mindful of my time constraint. Yeah. Specifically, with more availability of PPE, yeah. do you have plans, because the last time you issued reissued guidance was May 1st, do you have pl plans to issue any additional less stringent guidance to the field so we can further protect veterans and healthcare workers? We, we will as we resume normal operations. How many days worth of supplies will, it, will VA need to have on hand before you're comfortable to further reduce the austerity measures? Madam Chair, I thank you for your attention to this issue. And I just want to emphasize that our workforce is our strongest asset. We have a workforce that runs toward a challenge, and it is our utmost priority to ensure that they are safe. I apologize. Safe. My time is limited, and we do, we'll stipulate that we all very much appreciate their work. Yes, ma'am. And we have moved to universal masking throughout the pandemic. I'm proud to say that because of our early planning that began in January, our workforce has had what they need throughout the entirety of the response. Those on the front lines have N95 masks. Those in facilities have a mask a day. And every visitor to our facility, even if they are the caregiver of a veteran accompanying that veteran to a critical appointment. Right. But I'm specifically asking about the austerity measures. Because there, yes, I understand that there are issued masks, but the concerns that have been expressed, the whistleblower anonymous complaints I've been getting have indicated that they're required to reuse repeatedly those masks, to have them lay out in the sun in order to sanitize them. 
when, what are the current criteria in terms of a mask issuance and PPE issuance so that that reuse policy is not required? Madam Chair, thank you. Um, we are at universal masking right now. And in reference to the austerity measures, this was a move in line with CDC guidance the beginning of April as the global supply chain was in a state of uncertainty and as the virus was surging. We were certain that we had two weeks of supply on hand. What we weren't certain of was our ability to resupply. And we made a strategic decision for a very brief period of time to make sure that our supplies would reach until we could re be resupplied. At each point and each day across that time, our employees had what they needed and had N95s and masks and the full set of personal protective equipment that they needed to care for patients. And I, I would add right now, we, we sadly have about 500 employees who are infected. Um, the reason that number is stark is that that's 500 out of, in VHA, 330,000. Uh, so the measures that we put in place, arguably emergency measures, were designed in an emergency to take care of those who were the most immediately vulnerable. Um, I've been able to expand uh, the use of PPE as the emergency has changed. But I would also argue that the entire nation has been learning this on the fly. And as you and I have discussed for the first time in the history of VA, we did have to share resources with the city of New York, the state of New York, the city of Los Angeles. Um, we followed CDC guidelines. We followed them to the letter. We followed the same guidelines that you would find in Georgetown or uh, Medical Center or in NYU. And I think the results have shown that um, we have done an excellent job, better than any healthcare system in the country in keeping these numbers as low as we have. Okay, um, I'm sure that other members will get into the PPE uh, issue further. Um, I, with the committee's indulgence, I'm, I, I'm gonna ask an additional question and we'll you know, certainly recognize Judge Carter for longer than five minutes, but I, uh, I, I do want to uh, take a moment to enter the following into the record. Uh, a letter from myself, Judge Carter, from Chairwoman Lowy and, Chair and Ranking Member Granger of the Full Appropriations Committee to you, Secretary Wilkie, regarding the gravestones that have, uh, have been dis discovered that, uh, that are at the Sam Houston VA Cemetery in Utah, excuse me, in Houston, and uh, a VA cemetery in Utah as well that have the Nazi swastika as well as inscriptions honoring Hitler on them. Uh, so I'll ask uh, unanimous consent to, en to enter all of the following into the record. A statement from the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, to, that uh, urges you to recognize the offensive nature of those uh, inscriptions and statements and to remove them. A statement from B'nai B'rith International uh, that also asks you to re remove uh, those gravestones and the inscriptions and replace them with more appropriate, uh, more appropriate information about the deceased. A, uh, a statement from the ADL via their social media, the Anti-Defamation League, asking the same, and a statement from the American Jewish Committee asking for the same. Um, this is deeply troubling to learn that several VA cemeteries contain graves of German prisoners of war that feature swastikas engraved on the headstones, as well as inscriptions that honor Adolf Hitler. These graves sit right alongside men and women who fought for our country and our ideals, ideals that run counter to everything the swastika and the Nazi ideology represent. And I understand that these, these cemeteries were not under the jurisdiction of VA at the time these headstones were installed, but now that they are under VA's jurisdiction, there is no excuse for VA to continue to maintain these headstones instead of replacing them. The agency has claimed in its public response on this issue that you won't replace these headstones because the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 requires federal agencies to pr protect, quote, historic resources. In fact, what the Historic Preservation Act refers to as historic resources are defined as sites worthy of inclusion on the National Register of Historic Places. And in case you were wondering, the National Register criteria generally does not consider individual grave sites eligible, except in case of, quote, historical figures of outstanding importance. Certainly German soldiers who took up arms against the United States do not meet this criterion. Um, it appears that there is, that this is a 
This is relying on a gross misreading of a law that was enacted to preserve and protect historic sites and neighborhoods so that we did not erase our nation's history in the name of development. It is not a blanket excuse to avoid addressing past mistakes. So Mr. Secretary, um, I, I, uh, I really fail to understand why thus far you have refused to remove and replace these gravestones with Nazi insignia. Is that the kind of steward, stewardship that contributes to the, quote, inspiration and benefit of present and future generations as the law actually states? And if it's not, as you and I both know it's not, then how can you continue to claim that the VA is unable to replace these headstones simply because of historic preservation law? Well, Madam Chair, I'm going to, if you, if you don't mind, I want to take a moment of uh, personal privilege on this. Sure. Uh, you and I, in the last two years of our relationship, have, I have exchanged uh, speeches with you uh, that I have given in Israel, uh, that uh, I have given to the Jewish war veterans. In fact, I made a point that my very first speech at VA was with the Jewish war veterans. And as you know, my son in his senior year in high school uh, spent that year uh, working at the Holocaust Museum. Uh, this is a subject, the oldest hatred, uh, which I am very passionate about. Um, if you go to Yad Vashem, the words mean of memory and a name. Anti-Semitism is rearing its head all over Europe as we speak, and we've even seen it in some places in the country. I happen to agree with the president of Haifa University, who was quoted in that Wall Street Journal article that the last thing we need to do is not remind Americans of the horrors of anti-Semitism and the horrors of the Nazi cult. Uh, I have asked my people to look at various ways to address this. I happen to think that making sure that when people visit our cemeteries, they are educated and informed of the horror is an incredibly important thing to do. Um, erasing these headstones moves them, removes them from memory. And as we continue to study the Holocaust, the last thing any Holocaust scholar wants to do is erase that memory. I think we can find a way to put this in historical context. That is my view that we cannot, we cannot erase the horror and ignore it. We have to continue to hammer it. Um, my view is that we need to look at historical uh, interpretations that I am very happy to put up. And I would also note in that Historical Preservation Act in Section 106, uh, these cemeteries which we inherited from the Army are on the National Register of Historic Places. Mr. Secretary. I, I, would, I would have to engage in a very long process right now in order to erase. Um, no, no, Mr. Secretary. If you look closer at the wording of that statute that VA is... That, that you just cited, Section 106, that you're apparently hiding behind. It says that it's the policy of the federal government to, quote, administer federally owned, administered, or controlled historic property in a spirit of stewardship. A spirit of stewardship does not restrict VA from taking a serious look at the purpose these headstones once served and whether they are appropriate today in their current form. In fact, VA's own materials on this issue acknowledge that the law does not prevent you from removing them. The law merely sets forth the consultation process for taking action. VA could be begin that Section 106 process, as it's known, and you, as you just referred to right now, and start the process of removing these headstones. VA also clearly acknowledges that engravings on headstones can send messages about our values. For example, on VA's own website discussing the various emblems of belief that can be engraved, it says, quote, VA will not inscribe any emblem on a headstone or marker that would have an adverse impact on the dignity and solemnity of cemeteries honoring those who serve the nation. I would argue that swastikas, as well as the inscription that these headstones feature honoring Hitler, absolutely have an adverse impact in honoring those who served. We do not erase history by replacing these headstones in mo for modern times with more appropriate ins inscriptions and I am certainly not suggesting removing the dead who lie beneath the headstones, but I urge you to immediately begin the Section 106 process to replace these inappropriate and insensitive headstones. There are far more, uh, far more in, 
individuals across the world that think that that is absolutely essential when we look through the lens of modern times. And, since, and I hope you're not su re suggesting that replacing these few offensive headstones with neutral, neutral replacements done in a respectful way would be an unreasonable step to take in the name of sensitivity. You have soldiers who fought and died, who were killed by the Nazis who, whom they are lying next to and whose loved ones need to walk past inscriptions in American v veteran cemeteries that honor Hitler and have a Nazi swastika. The Nazi swastika is prohibited in Germany from being displayed because it is not seen as a reminder to prevent the hatred that it spawned. It is seen as something to be snuffed out. And there are certainly ways that you can put the gravestones in an appropriate historical context that don't lie above the, set, the, the, the graves of these dead. So I've taken far well, you, too. Well, let, me, yes. let, me, let me respond. I, I, think, I hope that I, I urge you yeah. and ask that you begin the Section 106 process, and will you do that? And I will certainly, I will, I will review everything. I'll, I'll just finish with a statement that was issued in 2018 by the American Council on Historic Preservation, which governs these matters. It is essential for decision makers to directly confront history's difficult chapters, consult broadly with the public to ascertain contemporary community views, and consider a range of management alternatives to promote public education regarding all aspects positive and negative of the nation's history. Uh, what I am just saying is that as someone who uh, cares deeply about this, and you know I do. I do. Um, I do want to do it in a way that still reminds Americans of the horror. And because of the times in which we live where we have seen anti-Semitism reach our shores, um, I want to make sure that VA is doing the best that we can to educate and remind people why those veterans in that cemetery fought against that horror from 1941 to 1945. So I just want my meaning clear um, about what I'm thinking. Mr. Secretary, but, I, don't, I don't want to prolong this, but and I certainly am not questioning your personal uh, commitment to, uh, to upholding uh, religious pluralism and uh, and uh, and fighting against anti-Semitism, but a review is not a commitment to begin the Section 106 process. And I can assure you that this is not the last time we're going to deal with this. This is going to be dealt with one way or the other. So I really would urge you to make sure that we can set aside those gravestones from the 1940s and uh, and put them in context historically. There are other places in these cemeteries to do that without having them appear. And that may be, that may be the, Reclaiming my time. Yeah, and that without, may be the answer. Reclaiming I, my time, Mr. Secretary, without having them appear yeah. above the, the, the graves of the Nazi POWs and having our families of those soldiers that were killed by Nazis walk past them when they visit their And and I, and I will conclude by saying I don't think we're that far off because I do think okay. that um, putting those in context in the cemeteries, as you just mentioned, is the way forward. It's just I'm gonna, I'll take a look, and Thank see you. what so we, we can do because I we do. have the we have the same goal in mind. And I, as I you know, that. I'm and very I, I'm very passionate about that issue. Thank you, I, I am as well as you can see, and I hope we reach the same conclusion is that they are not in the appropriate context now. Thank you very much for the committee's indulgence. I apologize, and uh, Judge Carter, you're uh, you're recognized for your. Uh, <laughs> for as long as you want to, basically. <laughs> thank, thank you very much uh, for the committee's intelligence. Judge Carter, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you for recognizing me. And uh, Secretary Wilkie, well, uh, welcome. Glad to have you here. I, uh, before I go to some of the parts of the questioning here, let, let's go back to the subject matter at hand. Uh, I, I, I love history and I read history and I read, uh, my hobby is reading history. I, and I, in trying to consider what probably happened in 1943 and 1944 when these things were erected, um, 
it's hard to conceive in the in the 21st century why they would be that way with all we know about the horrors of what went on uh, to the Jewish people and other people in those concentration camps. Uh, but if you if you will study your history, you realize that we had rumors of these things at the, at the governmental level. Uh, but you know they they weren't subject to forty eight hour twenty four hour news like we do. And uh, yet, so the the average American or the average soldier. Uh, he may not even have a concept of what was going on in the persecution world of Germany at that time. And when they, and if, even if you, you hear comments about how the attitudes changed after we actually discovered the concentration camps and our soldiers became even more vehement in their battle when they realized the horror that they were fighting against. So maybe the people that erected these stones didn't realize what historically that would be, how much it would affect uh, the Jewish people and Americans who, who are all horrified by what went on in Germany at that time. So I think that, that you should replace these stones with just a regular stone you still say they were German prisoner of war, but that's it. And take all the Nazi symbolism off. And, and if somebody wants to preserve those tombstones for history's purpose, then the historical commission can preserve them in some other way. But I don't think they should be displayed daily to the American public because of what they now that we know what happened and are aware of it. Uh, we want to. We 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 are offended by things like that. So, uh, and look, take it in context. I think we should definitely do it, and I think it's the right thing to do as Americans. Well, yes, sir, and I, and I think we're. At, if you we're, want to comment back, I'd be glad to hear from you. Yeah, we're we're, we're in the same place, um, and I mentioned earlier my only uh, concern, and it's one from. A passionate for you is to make sure that when we do this we are still reminding people of that horror and why those soldiers fought and that we educate because the last thing I mean there's a museum down the street that will not let people forget um, it is to never forget and uh, because of my feelings on this issue I want to make sure that if it's done it's done so that we still allow people um, to reflect, to contemplate, and to say also never again. Well, I sure hope we can work this out because it's very important to every member of this committee, uh, the, the Appropriations Committee. Uh, you'll note that all, both the chairman and ranking member of the full committee have endorsed our letter, and uh, we, we expect it to be done. Moving on, uh, the CARES Act provides you with $19.6 billion to respond to the COVID-19. As of last week, less than $2 billion of that money has been obligated. How much funding has been obligated as of today? How much has been allocated? And should we be concerned about the low rate of obligation? I'll let John Rachowski, our chief financial officer, ask. Answer that, Madam Chair, is that, is that all right? Yes, um, but before he answers, um, we, that, there is one vote that begins now, but we're voting in those groups. So I'm going to continue with the, uh, with the hearing, and members who have to go vote during their group should do so, and then just come back to the hearing. So yes, uh, Mr. Michalski, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the question. So uh, as of today, uh, I would say about $2.3 billion has been obligated. Um, and should we be concerned about that, or does it seem low? Uh, what I would say is we don't really have a precedent to compare. This is We're sort of creating the baseline today. Uh, we are finding many things out. At first, I thank the, uh, the, you know, the committee for the funds they provided. 
Uh, there were some, some expenses that were less, uh, some were more. For example, we were putting some workers into hotels so they didn't have to go home, uh, things like that. And so we're going to know a lot more in six months. I think that we are absolutely adequately funded at this time. The one thing I would say that we probably can make better use of this with some additional flexibility, and by that, I mean maybe some additional limited transfer authority. There are a couple of areas where we probably did not think, uh, think through what we needed. VBA for overtime and some education system upgrades, NCA for additional workload. But I think uh, we're providing updated uh, obligation reports weekly, and we're going to see how this goes. It's just there's nothing really to compare it to to know if that's low or high. In some cases, as you know, the materials and supplies weren't available when we wanted to buy them. We also have to go through the federal procurement process pretty much, and that takes a little bit of time. We have an old accounting system, so not everything is real time. But I think that we'll see this grow uh, pretty substantially, especially as uh, we, you know, we, we uh, resupply ourselves and have stock on hand. Judge Carter. Well, you know, the administration is considering a fifth supplemental funding package as needed. How much more do you think the VA, uh, uh, how much would you, you estimate the VA would need an additional supplemental package if we put one forward? Uh, how much more does VA estimate will be the need to address current COVID situation? What if the infection spike in the fall, as some are predicting? And if you were on this subcommittee, how would you balance the low obligation rate of the CARES Act uh, funding with your estimate of future needs? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so I think that uh, with respect to additional supplemental funding, I think uh, from what I see now, we're adequately funded. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the future with, with respect to spikes and things like that, but I think we're still, from a medical perspective, adequately funded. Uh, for additional needs, so not in that area. The one area I could see potentially additional needs, and we're working with our facilities folks uh, to, to see about accelerating reconfiguration of some of our facilities from multi-patient rooms to single patient rooms. That was something that we already knew, but can we accelerate that? That made a big difference. But that's probably the only area. If I was on the committee, I'll tell you what, we need more than money at this point is probably some additional flexibility that I mentioned to move some of the, the CARES money around um, and then some additional legislative, uh, uh, I think, provisions. We have one that's very important right now, and it has, it's sort of related, but, but not exactly. Uh, we need authority to keep paying our community care bills the way we are today. We call that obligate and pay. Uh, we have a legal ruling that we are probably not in compliance with the law, with the procurement law. Uh, if we don't get that authorization, we are going to be short about $5 billion in community care. Uh, but it's a matter of, of an accounting issue and a legal issue as opposed to a money issue. Judge Thank Carter. you, Madam Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you so much. Judge Carter yields back. Uh, next, I'd like to recognize uh, Chairwoman Lowy for her questions. I don't see Chairwoman Lowy on video. Is she still Please. with us? Okay. Chairwoman Lowy, your video is turned off. Okay, we'll um, we'll come back to we'll come back to the to the chairwoman, um, and uh, Mr. Bishop and Mr. Case have uh, have gone to vote. So, Ms. Pingree, you're uh, you're recognized for uh, five minutes for your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Secretary Wilkie, for being with us here today, and. Um, for the work you're doing to take care of our veterans. Um, thank you to all of your staff who we know are extremely dedicated to our veterans and are challenged every day working in the healthcare field. And our, so our hearts go out to the family of those veterans who have lost their lives uh, to COVID-19. I'm gonna take a little bit of a, a different tack, but I know we're talking about all the issues related to uh, the situations that people are struggling with with COVID-19, and one of them is around food insecurity. There's such a longstanding food insecurity crisis among our veteran population. Over a quarter of Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans have struggled to put food on the table, which is about double the national rate. Um, it's also uh, related to adverse health outcomes, which we know are an indicator for those people who are really struggling with this particular disease. And we know that food insecurity is exacerbated during this crisis. We've all seen the long lines at food banks and the challenges that many families are facing, and our veterans are particularly vulnerable. 
Um, as I said, it's also put, the pandemic has also put an extreme burden on uh, some of these disadvantaged populations, including those with underlying health conditions. Data shows that veterans have higher rates of multiple chronic disease-related conditions like heart disease, hypertension, and diabetes. So my concerns are around both, um, are we are we assessing food insecurity with our veterans and are we improving access to healthy food? It's much more of a long-term problem. So one of the challenges that we've seen during the COVID-19 crisis is it shows us some of the underlying issues that people are facing, whether it's around um, the underlying health conditions or just basically getting food at any moment in time, but today in particular. So can you give us a little update about how the VA is tracking food insecurity during this pandemic? And also, um, do you have data right now on the burden of obesity and chronic diet-related diseases within the veterans community? Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to answer the first part by saying that uh, the chair of the subcommittee um, uh, actually answered our most immediate food security need. Um, in your uh, emergency package, you upped the amount of money for per diem costs. Uh, which we have instructed those receiving them to use for, uh, amongst other things, their food. Um, and that, I think, has helped more people than you probably knew when you, when you mm. entered into that. So I, I thank the chair and I thank the committee for that. Um, I'll give you a statistic. In my parents' hometown of, of New Orleans, um, of those who passed uh, with the virus, 51% had diabetes. Uh, we have an aggressive uh, education and outreach program on food and on, on health related to food choices. And I'll let uh, Dr. McDonald go into the particulars, but uh, this is the subcommittee that, that recognized that problem. And we're certainly, we've certainly made, um, made up ground, particularly in the homeless community on this. Congresswoman, to follow on to what the secretary said, one of the silver linings in this extremely challenging time is the nation's emphasis on population health, and certainly that is our priority within VA. I thank you for pointing out this issue that the social factors affecting veterans, including food insecurity, and as we often focus on homelessness, are factors in their health. Chronic conditions are part of it, but where they live, how they live, is a huge part of their ability to succeed in combating this virus and succeed across this time. I'm proud to say that of the first billion in medical funding that you've graciously given us in the CARES Act, more than 20% of that, 205 million, has gone toward our homeless veterans and toward programs that help outreach to veterans and make sure that their food insecurity issues, that housing, rapid rehousing for them and their families are addressed. And I thank you also for calling attention to diabetes and chronic conditions specifically. It is important that we are engaging through our care teams in outreach to all of those patients we know are vulnerable. We are taking specific action to protect those populations that we know are significantly affected or at higher risk of COVID-19. As one example, we have conducted outreach to those veterans who have registered with us as being affected by burn pits. I'm actually one and received the text message myself. I know that this outreach is occurring as I myself am receiving it. And that outreach, outreach is important as we engage veterans and let them know that VA is here for them across this time, not just for medical conditions, but for the entirety and, and holistic approach to their life. Uh, well, thank you both for your answers. Um, it would be great uh, in the future to see a little more data and certainly to see more of an update once um, all the funding that has been allocated has been spent. And I do uh, particularly appreciate your comments around our homeless vets. Um, it breaks everyone's heart to think of um, anyone who served their country living on the streets or going hungry. Um, and particularly in these times, people who are homeless are some of the most vulnerable uh, with this disease raging in our community. So um, thank you. And I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Pingree. Mr. Hearn, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairwoman, um, first and foremost, I want to associate myself with Chairwoman Lowry's um, initial comments about the uh, Nazi symbolism in, in some of our most hallowed grounds and the need to remove that. And, and I appreciate the, the, the Chairwoman of our, of our subcommittee leading the charge on, on seeing that, that happen. 
Um, and, and also, I, 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 to, to the leadership of the committee and the staff, um, I feel like we've been doing more conversations now since COVID-19 than we were before, and, and I think that shows the commitment to, to the American people. Um, Secretary Wilkie, it's always a pleasure to be with you. And um, <clears throat> one of the things, I, I would like to highlight the, the um, South Texas Veterans Healthcare System based out of San Antonio, my mm -hmm. hometown. You know, they, they didn't experience a shortage of PPE um, that our private sector colleagues saw um, or academic affiliates saw. Um, they even went as far as help donate, um, you know, uh, per, uh, PPE to folks within the community to make sure the community uh, was in response. And, and they've also been leading in the Video Connect system that was already in use um, before COVID-19, and they're now a leader in the number of VA Video Connect episodes of, of care. And one of one of my one of my questions is, um, how do we ensure that for, for the foreseeable future that we're able to continue this level of, of technical, um, you know, uh, um, uh, technical support to our activities? Do we have the facilities that, and, and the spaces that where you can have the exam rooms to do some of this, this telemedicine and, and telecare? And how are we gonna make sure existing facilities are able to, to, to uh, deal with this and those outrageous, out, not outrageous, but amazing numbers you said at the beginning of, of your remarks, I'm Secretary Wilkie. Well, well, thank you, sir. And, and the people at Audie Murphy are, are, are wonderful. And um, you know, Texas is a place where you don't have to explain military service. Uh, to anyone. I'll just give you a couple of statistics that I, that I gave at the beginning. In April, uh, VHA provided 1.2 million mental health telephone and televideo visits. Um, and that is an astounding number. Um, we have stressed the system and I, believe, I don't believe we're going to go back. Uh, part of the change has been the distribution of thousands and thousands of tablets, particularly in rural and, and Native America. Um, I cut the ribbon uh, on the first of VA private sector telehealth clinic at a Walmart in Asheboro, North Carolina. I expect Walmart will be expanding that across the country, particularly as Walmart has a footprint uh, in most of rural America. Um, video telemedicine is the wave of the future, particularly in mental health. And, and I think um, we are now at a stage where we're not going to revert back to the old ways. Uh, this committee has, the subcommittee has recognized that uh, by funding our outreach. And I'll ask the practitioner if she has anything to say, Dr. McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, I, will, I will simply add that as part of the way we design facilities, even now, telehealth is included in those plans. And the beauty of the authority that you all have given us with the option to provide telehealth anywhere to anywhere, where a veteran is able to be at home in their living room, and our pr practitioners are able to deliver that care from anywhere they may be serving, that gives us the flexibility to use space and optimize space for the in-person care that's necessary, have the telehealth facilities as, as are needed in our VA medical centers, but deliver most of this care direct to a veteran's living room and meet them where they are and keep them safe in this time. So thank you for your attention to this. No, and, and we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep focus on this. A, a colleague of mine, Representative Herrera uh, Butler and I had been talking about the issue of sepsis. Um, sepsis is something that's already a leading, leading cause of death uh, within VA facilities, and we know COVID patients are, are susceptible. I know 10 VA centers are already using a new, more accurate uh, sepsis testing system, and this is even more important than ever. How are we expanding that across, the, across our systems? Sir, as, as I'm sure you are aware, sepsis is a complex constellation of syndromes, of symptoms, I should say. There have been several definitions over, of this over the past 20 years. And what it takes is recognizing um, clinically what we call gestalt, looking at the numbers of a patient, also observing how sick is this person and identifying this early so that you can act. You can hydrate the person. You can get them the antibiotics they need. Um, what several of our facilities, have, as you've referenced, are exploring 
is an automated way to synchronize that data and alert clinicians that this might be sepsis, then for them to make a, a more, uh, more immediate clinical decision to engage that patient. We already have extensive um, and consistent protocols across our system for this, um, and we have excellent data to show that we're effective in managing this. But these advancements in technology may take us one step further, and that, as you mentioned, will be important in this setting of COVID, where we know that this is a complication of the illness. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, now I'd like to recognize Mr. Cartwright. Oh, forgive me. I'm sorry. Mr. Case is back. Recognize Mr. Mr. Case for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, greetings from, from the Pacific, where you're remembered fondly for being the first VA Secretary to visit uh, some of our more remote VA communities, much less any federal ranking yes, federal official. And so thank you for not only trying to understand, but trying to feel that remoteness that the veterans uh, feel. Um, I wanted to follow up on the, and by the way, I want to commend your team uh, in Hawaii and throughout the Pacific. Uh, they've really done a really nice job through COVID-19, uh, not only in taking care of our veterans communities, but also in uh, interacting with our local uh, healthcare uh, fac facilities and, and providers. It's really, I Sir, think, may I, good... may, I, may I also mention that you're getting a new director. Pardon? Um, uh, Admiral Robinson, former Surgeon General of the Navy, uh, will be coming out in the next few weeks, and he is an outstanding public servant. Oh, excellent. So I, I, we, we appreciate that very much. Um, I think it's a good model of, of interaction with the civilian community uh, in the Hawaii and the Pacific, where we really have an inter-reliance. Um, and along those lines, my question uh, goes back to testing and, and PPE. I think, the, I think the, the question that I have, and this comes from my discussions with some of your team out there, um, of course, um, you know, Hawaii and, and the Pacific, uh, from a public health perspective, have done better than much of the rest of the country. Uh, that's come at the expense of our economy, by the way, because we shut down tourism to get those low numbers. So we have a tremendous uh, uh, economic issue where we're one of the worst in the country. Uh, from the um, testing side of it, the, 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 the concern is that um, while we were doing a pretty good job on the public health side, um, the testing and PPE were allocated elsewhere in the country to include, as I understand it at least, the VA uh, community so that it was, it was really considered uh, as an integral part really of that, of that broader community um, as, as scarce supplies were allocated. And of course, the concern there has always been that if, if we did see a surge or if, we, if there came a time where because we recovered tourism and started to see larger numbers of cases um, and as our military started to move around a little bit more, we have one of the largest military communities in the country and largest veterans communities in the country, we would see that surge and we would start to uh, detect a much a greater concern over the scarcity of uh, test kits and, and uh, PPE. And, and so, the, the, the question, and, and this also interacts with the civilian uh, community side where you really see uh, a little bit of a patchwork in terms of how the, um, uh, the non-veterans healthcare community, which the veterans community utilizes for the delivery of services uh, in Hawaii more than many of our uh, uh, other places in our country, that they have inconsistent um, rules in terms of, the, of the, uh, the use of testing. Some, for example, require all testing to come into any kind of a procedure. Some take a little bit more of a nuanced approach to that. Uh, but the bottom line is that that's using testing and PPE, which then gets into scarce supply throughout the entire system. And so I think my, 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 my question has to do with um, what does the, what is the um, ability of the Veterans uh, Administration to, to um, deliver test kits and supplies or to assure test, testing and uh, PPE to the to its facilities uh, in Hawaii and the Pacific, um, especially if we do see a surge, do they? Do you have an independent source? Do you do you have a way of of, of assuring that you're doing that um, um, in in a surge capacity, uh, regardless of kind of what the rest of our community is doing? Sir, yes, we are proud to say that due to early engagement with multiple different vendors and proactive planning, we do have an adequate testing supply at this point. Um, 145 of our facilities have rapid testing, and many of those facilities actually have multiple types available of testing, both rapid and typical antigen testing that returns in about two days. We are able to cross-level supplies of testing across the country, and we proactively work on pieces that are more 
challenging in the global supply chain, including, including nasal swabs and the transport media that is necessary to move the specimens to the test site. We also have a hub and spoke model, as I'm sure you're aware in your area, um, that helps us more rapidly process those tests and make sure that results are delivered to facilities and clinicians so they can make decisions as soon as possible and keep that care going for patients. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and, then, and Mr. Secretary, I'd be remiss if I didn't use this opportunity to again emphasize to you the importance of the Aloha Project uh, in Hawaii, which is our Advanced Leeward Outpatient Healthcare Access VA Multi-Specialty uh, CBOC. Uh, that has been a three-year, uh, two-year, too-long uh, project, uh, three years and fully funded, ready to go. Um, I've had this discussion with you and with other uh, VA folks, both in hearings uh, and offline. Um, it's, it's still hung up. Um, and it seems to be hung up somewhere uh, above VA in uh, GSA and OMB. Um, the issue seems to be OMB's um, uh, inability to understand that, that in Hawaii we do have higher health care costs, I'm sorry, higher land costs, uh, and therefore um, that has to be taken, in, taken into account in terms of, of the lease award. Um, the fact that, um, you know, Hawaii does tend to have, have higher lease, uh, lease, land lease costs um, should not disadvantage our veterans. This is a desperately needed facility. And I would put it in the COVID-19 uh, context as well, because it was needed before COVID-19, but it's definitely needed after, and it's definitely part of overall economic uh, regeneration for Hawaii, which, um, as I said, is one of the most devastated economically. Um, it seems to be that it's on its last few months, but uh, that's what we said last year. So I would really ask for your, for your personal attention to getting this over the finish line, getting that lease awarded so we can you know, cut through whatever's going on between GSA and OMB and, and VA and, and, and make the award and, and get this project underway. I, I agree with you, sir. And, and I've said that in a, in a country like this, particularly with the veterans population that we have, uh, one size doesn't fit all. Uh, the solution in Fayetteville, North Carolina, does not make any sense on the big island. Um, so uh, they've heard me. I will go back to them and see if I can, as you say, push it across the finish line, but I agree with you and I also agree with you about the needs, the particular needs of the veterans community on the islands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Case. Mr. Rutherford? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Secretary, uh, first on behalf of the 1.6 million veterans in my state of Florida, our, our, our home state of Florida. I want to say thank you uh, for, for the service. I, and I, I, want to, I want to talk about access to care a little bit here. Um, one of the, you know, you mentioned that uh, you've since the COVID-19, we've, we've seen 900,000 uh, telemedicine uh, encounters in and quite frankly, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that because I, I hear people talk about telemedicine as medicine that's good enough. Uh, and, and, and in fact, I had an individual that spoke to me about his yearly physical, uh, retired veteran who uh, in the past would get the blood work up and um, would go in and the doctor would go over those results with him and this year, his physical was a, a five-minute phone call, no blood work, because he was in a low-risk population. Um, but the whole purpose, and, and this goes to the, the underlying health concerns that have been highlighted, as you mentioned earlier, uh, by COVID-19, the, the focus on, on health and finding issues before they become serious issues, that's what that physical is for. Uh, so, so my question is, can you tell me, first of all, define for me what a telemedicine uh, encounter is? Because in the private world, I think it's going to be even more uh, concerning because whether it's CMS paying for that or, or insurance companies, you know, exactly what is the definition of that, a five minute phone call, is, a, is that a, a, a telemedicine encounter? And um, 
So how do you find that? Are there areas where you think it's not effective? See, I, you know, I mean, I, I would think if, if we're going to have a phone conversation for a doctor to simply go over blood work with me to tell me where I'm high, where I'm low, what may need to be followed, I, I think that is reasonable. But for a physical to, to devolve into just a five-minute phone call, I, I question whether that's the best use of telemedicine. I'll, I'll answer what, what has happened in the last three months, and then I'll let the, the, Dr. McDonald, the practitioner, give you the, the details. Um, we were the first healthcare system in the country to stop routine visits. Uh, we had to do that. Uh, as the chair has, has pointed out on numerous occasions, not only in this setting, but in, in phone calls, um, I was making sure that we were preserving uh, our people and preserving our equipment. So those routine visits did stop in terms of face-to-face, -face, but we made up for that uh, in, in telemedicine encounters. We had to do that to protect patients and to protect our staff. I would say the wave of the future for telemedicine is not in what you just described. It's really in mental health. It is allowing people to address these deep issues in the comforts of their home or they can visit the library or wherever they feel comfortable to talk to our mental health professionals. That's where we've seen the biggest explosion. And I'll let mm -hmm. Dr. McDonald answer the rest of the question. Congressman, to emphasize what the Secretary said, you're right that there is care that belongs in person. And that, that high touch, that meaning of the patient and provider relationship direct person to person, the privilege of that encounter is frankly why I went into medicine. And that is important to us. And to the Secretary's point, that can actually be delivered effectively via telemedicine. To your question about physicals, we are actually going above and beyond and conducting outreach to veterans, meeting them where they are, not causing them to wait for a physical anymore, but making sure that we know their concerns in advance. We're now emphasizing the ability to do that for a, through a phone call, to coach them through the click of a simple link to spin up a video and conduct that visit in a more frequent, high-touch way that meets their concerns before they have to wait for that annual visit. <clears throat> to the question of the five-minute encounter, I would offer that sometimes that's the right answer for the person, but via telehealth, we can still have that meaningful, deep discussion and spend the time that's necessary to address their concerns, and that's how we're approaching it. We train our staff extensively on that so that there's really meaning on both sides of that virtual okay. encounter. If, if I could ask one last question. <clears throat> this deals with access. Quickly, In 2016... Quickly, Mr. Rutherford. Pardon me? Quickly, if you can. Uh, very quickly. <laughs> to recognize. In 2016, the VA authorized three of the four advanced practicing nursing uh, fields to go to full practice authority, but you did not include the uh, certified registered nurse anesthetist in that. And the argument was that they, there was adequate access. But I'm hearing that there is a lot of access being delayed because the, the CRNAs are not uh, available. So uh, can, can you address that? And is there, is there any consideration to giving them full uh, practice authority? Um, Madam Chair, may I? Yes, Mr. Secretary, you recognize to respond. Um, the, um, the Cerner program, Cerner program uh, was done uh, carefully. Um, we provided our Cerners with full practice authority only in those states where the states had offered full practice authority. I believe we've only hired 18 additional Cerners, but, but that, that was the, those were the parameters of the practice, and we, and we did that because we needed so many hands on deck for the emergency rooms and the COVID wards. Yes, Congressman, we are finding that COVID-19 patients, as I'm sure you've heard from your constituents, 
are difficult patients to ventilate at times. This can take up to 90 minutes of a very skilled experience intensivist time. VA has long been a leader in team-based care and team-based anesthesia care, and CRNAs have long been vital members of those teams. We've moved in alignment with industry in this pandemic to make sure that they have full practice authority in those states where that is already occurring. To the Secretary's earlier point, that also gives us a better ability to recruit and retain those essential providers for our teams. We have seen a response rate to offers for RNs at 80% <clears throat> of those offers we extend. For CRNAs, before we extended that full, full practice authority in those states, it was only 8.7%. We need these members of our teams, and we need that level of agility to respond effectively and deliver the access that you mentioned originally. Thank you. And I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Robert Thurden. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, I believe Chairwoman Lowy is, has returned, although I Saw her for a moment, and no, I didn't. Do not. Okay, Chairwoman and Lowy, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you very much. First, Madam Chair, I want to thank you for your comments at the very beginning of the question period. Those symbols on the tombstones go right to the heart of many people who visit, and I thank you very, very much. Um, and I want to thank the secretary for your thoughtful presentation. I do want to follow up with a couple of the questions. Um, first of all, I want to get an understanding from you what's happening with the hydroxychloroquine. I am concerned that the VA administered hydroxychloroquine, which was unproven for treatment of COVID-19, to more than 1,300 veterans, despite a lack of evidence of its effectiveness. We know now that patients who are prescribed this drug were more likely to die than those who received standard treatment. What was the rationale for administering this drug to vulnerable veterans? And were they fully aware of the risk before receiving it? Has the president's reckless endorsement led to an increase in veterans requesting the drug? Can you explain to me what is happening? Well, let me, let me talk about this, this period of time that we're in. Uh, this is a new disease. And even though I am not a medical person, I'm a military person, I understand that there has to be hope. Uh, you can't look at a patient and say, we can't give you hope. What I relied on was the vote of this Congress, uh, the right to try. Uh, the right to try that was endorsed by the president with his signature. This Congress was very clear in saying that if people of sound mind uh, ask to be given experimental treatments because that may be the last thing that separates them from life and death, that we do that. Uh, the other option was to do nothing. Uh, every, everyone is, is learning in this in real time, and we have followed FDA guidelines on this. Now we have, I just, I think I gave the chair a chart. We have brought down the use of this. It peaked when it peaked in the rest of the Ms. country some, sometime just, in April. Let me just ask you to pause and yeah. I'll ask unanimous consent to enter the chart uh, that is labeled hydroxychloroquine timeline and utilization into the record. Right. The Without use of this, um, Madam Chair, um, uh, peaked when it peaked in the rest of the country. And we started ratcheting it down as we went more to remdesivir and we went to the, the uh, convalescent uh, plasma. Uh, last week, we only used it three times. Um, I talked to Dr. Fauci yesterday. Uh, as you know, I serve on the National Coronavirus Task Force. He said to me that we still have to leave the door open because with all of these studies, uh, there still has not been randomized control trials. Now that said, it is our doctors and our practitioners who are working with our patients. These are people dedicated to the preservation of life. Uh, again, we are all learning as we go in this, in this crisis. Uh, I would also add that uh, the rest of the world is all over the map. France banned it and then the government of India said it is absolutely essential for them to provide their people with it. Uh, to protect them from, uh, from the virus. So um, 
again, we, are, we have ratcheted down as we brought more treatments on, online, and I expect that trend to continue uh, in the future. But we, our mission was to preserve and protect life. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for your commitment. However, however, I would hope that the VA would respond to the science that is clearly coming from Dr. Fauci rather than some wishful thinking coming from the president. But let's move on to another question. It's very disappointing to me that the VA was using that drug that Dr. Fauci did not endorse. And I've known Dr. Fauci on the committee forever, uh, for at least 30 years. And I would listen to him rather than the president when we're looking for scientific information. Uh, I'd like to get to the mental health issue because we know that social isolation poses dangers for the general population, but particularly for the veterans who have suffered with mental illness can you tell me what the VA is doing to continue connections with at-risk veterans during this time of stay-home orders? And are you anticipating an increase in mental health services when this pandemic subsides? Well, we have, we have changed the way we do business when it comes to mental health care. And I think that is the silver lining uh, from this, this crisis because we have sent out over 40 million individual communications, not just to veterans, uh, but to families and caregivers. We're unique as a healthcare system in that, like the military, when someone joins, the family joins. And uh, we have expanded our footprint in mental telehealth, uh, I think to the benefit not only of the veterans today, but the benefit of veterans to the future. I will be, Madam Chair, um, releasing, uh, inaugurating our Prevents Task Force recommendations on mental health and suicide prevention on June 14th. Uh, that will be the first national roadmap uh, that will fall in line with the question that you just asked uh, about the way of the future when it comes to mental health. I think we will be the first uh, large healthcare organization to have a national conversation to, or to invoke a national conversation on mental health and how we treat it. That also will include a roadmap on homelessness and will also include a roadmap on addiction. Um, that is in line with your thinking and I know that is in line with the thinking of the chair. Thank Madam you. Chair, I believe uh, my time is up. I'm not sure what timing we're using. Shall I your your time your time has expired, Madam Chair. But we thank will, you very we, much, Madam we'll, Chair. Thank you. We'll do a set. We'll be in. We'll be doing a second round, so uh, there'll be another opportunity. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and just you know, before we move on to the next question, I'll just note, uh, Mr. Secretary, for the record, that the Dr. Fauci said just yesterday on hydroxychloroquine that the scientific data is, and I quote, "The scientific data is really quite evident now about the lack of efficacy." So he's made it very clear yes. where he is on the effectiveness and, of and, uh, and as I mentioned, I talked to him after he made that statement and relayed his thoughts to him. Thank you. Uh, uh, next, we have Ms. Roby. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. At a time when we are in the midst of the most serious health pandemic uh, in over a century, the Central Alabama Veterans Healthcare System still has multiple leadership and staff positions that are unfilled. Uh, currently, there is no permanent director. Uh, there's a pending start date for a chief of staff. There's no permanent deputy chief of staff, and there are an additional six service chief openings with no permanent staff at Cabot's. It remains unacceptable that Cabot still has so many senior staff openings, I just don't understand how you, Mr. Secretary, can expect to bring about positive change for our veterans' care and the management to the VA employees when you have no permanent leadership to bring about this change. It's especially concerning that after the previous director left in September of 2019, we still do not have a full-time director, and it's almost June. 
We know that Central Alabama VA has much improvement to make um, and the right attention at the highest levels of the Department of Veterans Affairs is warranted, which is not effectively happening now. My office continues to have difficulties in getting answers from CAVEX to even the simplest of questions. In preparation for this hearing, my office reached out to the VA staff here in Washington and directly to CAVEX with questions about staffing vacancies. My Washington office received a fairly prompt response while my district office has yet to receive an answer from CAVEX and made that request 13 days ago. While I appreciate the response time of the VA staff here in Washington, the staffing vacancy data was readily available because it had been included in a report provided to Congress on May 14th. That report specific to CAVEX was required by law due to language that thankfully uh, the, the chairwoman uh, and I pushed to include in the appropriations bill last year. And for the members of this committee, we had to put language into law to get the VA to communicate with me specific to CAVEX. If I said repeatedly, it has been difficult, if not impossible, to get prompt responses from your office. Apparently, the only way that we are able to get you to provide information is if this committee requires you to by law. Or if you're scheduled to testify before our committee, the inf information is nicely delivered right before a hearing. My office has been left uh, in the dark with the COVID-19, mostly in the dark with, as it relates to COVID-19 and updates from CAVIX. Since this pandemic began, CAVIX has held only two congressional staff briefings, both in April. That seems to be woefully inadequate, especially when it is my understanding that Birmingham, and for those of you who are not familiar with Alabama, it's about an hour and a half north of Montgomery, the Birmingham, Alabama VA has been providing congressional COVID-19 briefings every two weeks. I was encouraged to hear that CAVEX would be holding their first congressional uh, COVID-19 briefing in over a month this Friday, May 29th. Well, that was fleeting because that briefing was just postponed yesterday. It was not postponed for a week or two weeks. It was postponed for an entire month, meaning it will be two months uh, in total since we've heard from CAVEX on COVID-19. Madam Chair, I know uh, you and our colleagues on this committee have continuously heard my pleas and pushed to improve the management and overall care for our veterans in Central and Southeast Alabama. And please know that I will continue to push for answers and actual improvements, actual improvements until my last day serving in Congress. Mr. Secretary, my wish is and my hope, not for me, but for the veterans that I serve, is that we won't continue to talk about how we hope CAVEX will improve, but that your actions as the top leader in the VA will demonstrate to those veterans the actions, real improvements, will demonstrate your commitment to CAVEX. So I'll give you an opportunity to respond uh, to, to my comments. Madam Chair, is it uh, I'm past the time, may I? Uh, no, <laughs> you, you can respond. All right. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Secretary. Um, well, I, I will say um, one of the first visits I made uh, as Secretary was to Central Alabama, uh, both to Montgomery and to Tuskegee. Uh, I think I was the first Secretary to ever visit Tuskegee. I'm very proud of that. Um, I paid attention to it. We have changed leadership. Um, I believe that uh, the folks in Montgomery and Tuskegee have provided the entire state of Alabama with important services. We have placed many of our employees in central Alabama at the Bill Nichols State Veterans Home uh, to help, help the veterans there who were in deep crisis. The staffing issues that you're talking about, and I understand the, the value of permanence, uh, but those positions are occupied. I have the same issue in my central office, in my, in my office. I have an acting deputy. Uh, I have an acting chief of staff. 
um, that doesn't mean that the work is not being done. Uh, we are in the midst of revamping our entire HR program at VA. I agree with you the first time that you raised this issue that uh, it was not adequate for the entire country and certainly not adequate for central Alabama. And as you know, uh, my family lives in North Alabama. So it's a state that I'm in a lot. Um, and we're doing everything we can to, to make those positions permanent. We have new leadership, as you know, both in Atlanta and in Montgomery. And I think, if I, I think that uh, the services have improved across that visit. Uh, and I will continue to focus on it because, one, I'm very familiar with, with the area. And um, I've heard you. And uh, believe me, uh, the secretary in general, its focus has been to personally uh, move on the leadership issues in your district. And um, I wish I could say I could snap my fingers and they would all be fixed. But uh, I think it's in a better place than it was when you first raised the issue with me. I don't know who had, Mr. Bishop has the gavel. I, I would just say uh, to you, Mr. Secretary, where there have been some improvements, the situation is still very dire. And whereas I want nothing more than to celebrate improvements in care for our veterans, we have a long way to go. And it feels like every time we have this conversation that, that I'm the only one that feels a sense of urgency here. And I just want to see more passion and urgency from your office and dedication to dealing with, we're still one of the worst VAs in the country. And I have been banging my fist for years on this issue. And so, again, I want to celebrate whatever improvements there are to celebrate, but just know we have a very long way to go. And I'm sure Mr. Bishop could comment on that as well. And I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentlelady. Um, let me uh, welcome you, Mr. Secretary. Um, let me thank you for all of the efforts that you and the team at VA have undertaken to continue services to our veterans under these extreme pandemic conditions, as well as your efforts to keep both the services providers and uh, our veterans safe during the process. But let me uh, ditto and uh, uh, join and associate myself with uh, Ms. Roby's remarks. Uh, while she uh, represents Alabama, I represent the West Georgia aspect of CAVIX, and uh, we have some serious concerns, and we continue to raise them, and Ms. Roby's voice is not the only voice that has been raised with those concerns. Uh, the delays uh, that have been caused by COVID-19 have caused delays in your systems and your plans across the country, and I assume that uh, the delays also have uh, come in responding to uh, the questions that I raised uh, uh, last time we spoke uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the VA uh, center that is to be constructed in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, and at this point, I'm, I'm very, very frustrated uh, that after almost a decade, uh, we're still waiting. And of course, after the contract was let, it was relet. And uh, the, the site that was selected uh, for a second time uh, is a site that has no public transportation. It's away from the long-established medical uh, campuses that have specialists uh, for our, our veterans. And, of course, uh, it's not very convenient at all. And uh, the, as I indicated uh, the last time we spoke and the time before that, uh, we have yet to receive a satisfactory answer as to what went into that decision and whether the proposed location uh, can be changed uh, and can be made more accessible. Uh, this has been a process that has been ongoing now for almost a decade. Uh, so I'd like for you to comment on that. And of course, uh, I have a second line of questions uh, uh, with regard to the, uh, uh, the impact that the uh, COVID-19 has had uh, uh, which caused you to pause all of your in-person compensation and, and uh, pension uh, examinations. Um, I understand that that was to keep you, the uh, veterans and the uh, physicians safe during the pandemic, uh, but some of the exams are being completed using the telehealth technology, and uh, file reviews, though 
through the, I think you call it the Acceptable Clinical Evidence Initiative. Uh, and I understand that you're exploring new exam delivery models, such as a telehybrid model and the extension of authority to allow the compensation and pension examination providers clinical licenses to cross state lands. Uh, I'd like for you to tell me what additional tools you need from Congress to ensure delivery of timely and high quality CMP exams. Uh, with the pause of the CMP exams over the past two months, what course of action you will take to uh, address the ballooning backlog and uh, what are the technological changes uh, VA is looking at in addressing uh, the coverage for elderly patients and other vulnerable populations to ensure the safety of both the patients and the providers? Uh, please address the yes, Columbus, sir. Georgia issue first. I, I will address Columbus first and then let, if you, if you don't mind, let Dr. Lawrence answer the compensation issue. Uh, you're right. Um, what's happened in Columbus is not acceptable. I can say that uh, I have the same same issue in Mr. McCarthy's district in Bakersfield, uh, California. Um, we are taking a, a look at the way we uh, acquire and, and build properties. It is, a, it is a 19th century system stuck in the 21st century. Um, it's, it's doubly important in your district because I think at the end of this year, Georgia will have the fifth highest number of veterans of any state in the country. Um, and um, I will uh, continue to push and we'll get you another report as soon as I was started, as soon as I leave, I agree with you. It is unacceptable. Um, and I will, uh, when we can take these masks off, I will promise to come see uh, with my eyes uh, and be with you uh, to look at that site. Sir, in terms of the compensation and pension exams, CMP exams, very much appreciate your question. Um, we follow the lead of our hospitals, the VHA. They stopped doing these exams on April 2nd for obvious reasons of safety. We told our contractors to stop on April 3rd. You're right, we did some telemedicine, some hybrid, and something called ACE, as you indicate. But you're right, the failure to meet in person, um, you can only do those, those things I just described and you described for a limited number of the total. The failure to be able to do in-person compensation and pension exams sets us back as we can't process claims. We're partially awarding claims. We're awarding some of the claims we have, but this is a big deal. We are working with the vendors to get ready to reopen, again, following VHA's lane. You were generous to ask what do we need. We have a request before you to do two things. Allow doctors who do these exams to practice across state lines and allow non-doctors, essentially nurse practitioners, to do some of these. We think that'll greatly expand our capacity, which will bring down the backlog. I know you're concerned about the backlog, sir. This morning it's 114,000. In November, it was 64,000. We know how to drive it down. We're not proud of this. Our team is embarrassed. We want to open up, get the CMP exams, and get back to that very low number. Thank you, sir. I think my time has expired. At this time, I recognize Mr. Cartwright. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. And thank you, Mr. Secretary, for coming today. I, um, I listened to your opening statement, and uh, you said that uh, we have, we've lost hundreds of veteran patients to this COVID-19 disease. And in fact, that's, that's what you wrote in your written opening statement as, as well. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Um, with, um, with over, uh, well, what I have is uh, uh, 1,100 VA patient deaths in, in my statistic. Was that no, sir, it's, it's 700. It's 700? Yes, sir. That's 11,000 infections and about 9,000 of those 11,000, I can get you the exact number, okay. have fully recovered. So right now, we have a total of 1,500 veterans in our 170 hospitals who you have You said infections. that. Yes, I got that. Okay, so we're here doing oversight, obviously, and this committee is here to, is to be uh, here to be helpful to veterans, their families, and their caregivers, who are, and everybody is understandably frightened of this disease and their health prospects during the pandemic. Um, there's been some debate, and I wanted to bring it up with you about um, how much authority the VA has over state-run veterans' homes. Now, we're very proud. I'm from Scranton, Pennsylvania, and we have the Gino Murley Veterans Center, which has had no deaths, zero. It's a state-run veterans' home in Scranton. 
But that's not been the case all over the country, uh, and we have to talk about this. Um, debate about whether state-run veterans' homes that receive federal payments and are subject to federal inspections. Now, Mr. Secretary, you've taken the stance that the protection of veterans from infectious spread in those state homes should be left to the states. And my question is, um, did that work well? Uh, my understanding that is that there are hundreds of veterans across the country who have died from COVID-19 in state-run veterans' homes. Am I correct in that? that? That is true, and I think we, we account for many of those in our numbers that I will give you. Okay, so here's where I'm going with that. Uh, uh, might a stronger, more comprehensive, united policy, uh, maybe one that takes into account where our victories have been, like in Scranton, might a, a, a stronger, <laughs> unified response for the 50 states work better for the state home veteran residents um, where lives were lost? So, um, it is, I think it's one of the most important questions that will come out of this. Um, and if you, if you would indulge me for a minute, and, and I will talk about the two separate systems and why Congress did what it did and what we do in how relation about, to How states. about 30 seconds? Okay, real. Um, the Congress was very clear in separating us from state veterans' homes in terms of management, operation, and control. In fact, it says it several times in, in the statute. We provide surveys just as the Joint Commission does for the 6,700 hospitals around the country. I'll give you the example of Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, we delivered a report to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts on January 31st, 52 pages with seven recommendations, including infection control. The Commonwealth is the certifying authority for that home. We do provide those recommendations. Um, when this hit, I began calling governors. I called your governor, called the governor of Massachusetts, governor of New Jersey, said, what do you need from VA? We're there to provide that, that bridge between the states and the locality. Uh, in your neighboring state, we've come in and taken control of two nursing homes. Um, I think there needs to be a debate, a clearer debate, on what the final federal responsibility is for those state veterans' homes. Okay, we'll talk about that, but I have to move on. I want to talk about testing of VA employees. Yes. Mr. Secretary. Now, there's a VHA Directive 1047 issued on April 21 this year. Uh, it deals with the All Hazards Emergency Cash Program and has an appendix. It's, the, uh, direct, it's an opinion from the Office of General Counsel. And subsection F of that opinion says, pursuant to statute, uh, VA has the authority to provide certain health services to its employees. Uh, and that includes that VA has the authority to provide medical countermeasures to employees. Now, the VA already provides key immunizations to its own employees who are not veterans and who are not eligible for routine health care from the VHA. Do you agree with the general counsel's statement of authority that this type of medical countermeasure is both appropriate and legal? Congressman, yes, we do. We have Good. testing available for employees. Good. And can we agree that uh, testing VA employees who are routinely exposed to COVID-19 patients would provide an infection spread uh, prevention benefit? We move in lockstep with the science, sir, and CDC guidelines, yes. Thank you. So as a medical countermeasure to prevent patient-threatening conditions, as described in the general counsel's opinion, does the VA currently offer testing to its non-veteran employees who are routinely exposed to COVID-19 patients? We do, sir. Our employees who are symptomatic or who request a test from us are able to get one through us or through their outside health insurance, should they have that, yes. Well, I, I'm glad you said that because here's why I asked. Uh, as I say, I'm from Northeastern Pennsylvania and we have a VA medical center there. And that testing was not offered in May or this, or so far in, it wasn't offered in April or so far in May at the Wilkes-Barre VA Medical Center. Employees there, including those caring for COVID-19 patients, have been required to seek testing elsewhere if they were not veterans themselves. 
and so ineligible to register with the VA for comprehensive medical, medical, medical care. Here's my question. Were either of you aware of that, that going on at the Wilkes-Barre uh, VA? I, I was not aware of what was going on in Wilkes-Barre. All right. Well, we I will need take to, a look at that. We need to talk about that. Yes, sir. And I'll have more questions in the next round. I yield back. Thank you, sir. Uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize uh, the gentlelady, Ms. Bustos. All righty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Secretary Wilkie, I want to thank you and your team for, for being here with us today. Um, I'm actually going to uh, start off a little bit where uh, Chairwoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz started on the question about uh, PPE. And, I, and Matt, if I have any time, I'll, I want to go into testing a little bit as well. Um, and you may recall this, Secretary Wilkie, um, when um, you were here on March 4th uh, talking with us about your, uh, your budget request, um, I asked you about the VA's ability to respond to the coronavirus. So that's going way back to, to March 4th. At that time, here was what you answered to my question about your preparation. You said, this is your quote, we train for epidemics. We began moving on supply chain and preparation really before this became a national issue. That was your quote to me on that, on that date. Uh, you assured us at that time that the VA was uniquely prepared among government agencies to respond to the coronavirus. And you testified that your agency had been, quote, augmenting the supply chain, end quote. Um, so those were the assurances on March 4th. Then let's fast forward a little bit to uh, late April. Dr. Stone, the executive in charge of the Veterans Health Administration, described that your system was facing severe shortages with some of your hospitals near, quote, end quote, austerity levels of personal protective equipment. Um, so again, you, you talked about your agency training for epidemics. You began preparation early, yet it was about a month later that your hospitals faced this dire situation. So. Um, wondering what the disconnect was in that very, very short amount of time between what you told us as a, as a committee here, subcommittee, and then what Dr. Stone talked about just a short time later. Um, well, there, there isn't a disconnect. What happened in between the time that I testified and the time that Dr. Stone delivered those remarks was that a national emergency was declared and that the provisions that we made for independent supply chain um, and equipment uh, was disrupted. Uh, we no longer had access to that as things flowed into the national stockpile and that that equipment was spread across the country. Um, I mentioned earlier, I'll do this really fast, I'm looking at ways to prevent that from happening again uh, in the event that this thing boomerangs back on us in the fall. Um, but that, that is what, what happened. Uh, but I think in, in the rest of Dr. Stone's remarks, he probably said that we did not fall uh, beyond two weeks of supplies in any of our hospitals. We never ran out because we have the ability to do what they call the Navy cross deck. There are huge swaths of this country where this virus is not impacted. If you look at North Dallas to the Canadian border to Idaho down to New Mexico, there are very few patients. And we were able to move supplies from those areas into areas that were hot spots, particularly in the northern part of, of your state, uh, where we also opened up our hospital to civilians, our hospitals to civilians. So um, do you have what you need now? I mean, I know you talked a little bit uh, ago about your level of supplies, but you also just mentioned in your response to me about should this um, yeah. We have a second wave that re really kicks off. Yeah. How are you, you also mentioned the supply chain. So talk about if, if the numbers do tick up um, to a much greater level um, and the supply chain issues that you mentioned in your own opening remarks, how's, how's this all coming together and how, what assurances can you give us, give the veterans, give the employees that you will be ready? Well, we are, we are marshalling resources and storing them up. Okay. Uh, at a greater pace than we had um, back in February, which was right before I testified. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been also talking to uh, CEOs of large corporations to make sure that um, as the national emergency subsides, we start getting uh, large numbers of equipment from them, everything from masks to gowns 
So that, that is the plan. Um, I'm, I'm establishing depots across the country. It's an old mil military model. But I will, I have to be honest, and the chair, chair knows this, I said uh, right after I testified uh, and the national emergency was declared that we were not working in optimal conditions. Um, and we had to compensate for that. Thank the Lord. We've had a very, very low incident of infection amongst our employees. Right now, of the 330,000 employees we have, there are 500 active infections. Um, but we don't want to face another situation where I come and tell the chair that it is not optimal. Uh, and I think I've been very clear uh, in stating that, and that we don't want to go through that again. All right. Uh, my time's expired. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Bustos. Mr. Ryan, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary, always good to be with you. Thank you for all your work. And good please pass you, along our uh, regards to all the men and women in the VA uh, who are on the front lines. Uh, I appreciate your, uh, let me first associate myself with the chair's remarks from her uh, comments, and uh, we'd appreciate you addressing that issue to the best of your ability. Um, you know, I, I appreciate your remarks around telemedicine. There are some tectonic uh, shifts happening in the economy right now and in uh, some of our institutions, and I think digital learning, telemedicine, there are going to be some huge shifts. Uh, and so we want to continue a conversation with you about how we continue to build out uh, telemedicine with regard to uh, the VA. Um, in addition to what uh, Ms. Bustos was just saying, uh, I represent Youngstown, Ohio. America makes the uh, National Innovation Center built around additive manufacturing. I know there's a MOU in the works with the VA and America makes with regard to uh, 3D printing uh, PPE into the future. Uh, so I hope that, that we can get that worked out as quickly as possible so that uh, when there is a second or third wave, we have already done the, the legwork and the groundwork to be able to tap into the maker movement in the United States, which could be uh, very helpful uh, in this regard. Two um, quick questions for you. One, um, one is about the DBQs. Um, so I know that the VA reverse policy on processes relating to the applications with uh, disability benefits and the questionnaires. Um, my VSOs back in Ohio, and I think across the country, uh, thought that this simplified the process for a veteran to obtain sufficient medical evidence, and the impl implementation of these forms were a key part of the reduction of the backlog of claims. Uh, and so many of the VSOs see this as a step backwards. Can you just walk me through your logic on this uh, situation and why, and why you did it? Certainly. Certainly, sir. I'm glad you asked about this because I think there's a lot of confusion about it. Um, we welcome all evidence from any medical provider that supports a veteran's claim. So that can come in any forms. The public-facing DBQs were victims of fraud and misleading information that for-profit vendors were taking advantage of our veterans. In addition, by virtue of their public face, we could not keep up with the changes. We had to go through the OMB process. It was designed in a period of time when we were very much paper-based. It had essentially been over overcome by events, quite frankly. But again, any veteran can provide any medical information. The DBQ was in some ways becoming irrelevant uh, for the situation and was a real source of fraud that we were, we were working on. And were you working with the VSOs on this and the VSO Herm Brewer and the VSO Association? Absolutely. We formed a group to consult with them to get their opinions about this. So it's perplexing that after the fact, after we work with them to hear this, they, they understood the situation too. And it troubles us to sort of see what has happened with this. And again, the public facing nature of it prevented us from being able to change it as things were changing. But again, they're all aware they have access to our systems, as you know, with cards that enable to see the veterans' records and the like. So again, we welcome all information from their private providers. That's never been the issue. It's been this form that has been unintentionally, you know, turned into something that's really causing uh, additional problems. Okay, well, I, I just whatever I can do to be helpful to make sure that we get everybody on the same page here. Sure, I no, I welcome that. Thank you for the question, and we, I'll, I'll reach out to Herm, too. I, and make I sure. know, like many members of Congress, I mean, we rely on our VSOs. I mean, those are our boots on the ground. 
uh, you know, in, in the foxhole every single day. So I want to just make sure that, that, that their voice is being heard in, in this process. One uh, final quick question here, uh, Mr. Secretary, if you could. Um, with the, regard to the disability benefit applications, a lot of the older vets, uh, pretty good, I like that. I wish I could do that, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> um, they, they find it difficult to use the technology and uh, they are really comfortable with going to the offices and, and, and kind of getting the eyeball to eyeball and these offices have been have closed. What is the process you guys are gonna put in place to re-engage a lot of these vets who may, may, we may not be connected with them right now? Sure, um, again, we're gonna follow VHA's lead in terms of the three-step process to open using the right protocols and the like, welcoming the least risky veterans in and going to the most risky, using all the different things. So we're gonna follow their process. In addition, and here's a touch to your first question, sir, we're working closely with the states and counties as they reopen because, as you know, they can serve veterans too. So we want to have multiple um, ways of access. And finally, of course, we know some veterans will not leave their home regardless of what we do, but they want in personal service. So we regularly advertise this number, 800-827-1000. They can call us. These are VBA employees, and we can take their application over the phone. So we're very sensitive to the situation, and we will be communicating how we're opening, how we're engaging the public in person. I, I would say, Mr. Ryan, that I've actually been amazed at the uh, embracing of many of the telehealth changes by older veterans. I mean, I'm a, I'm a computer Neanderthal myself. Um, but um, we've had so many encounters. Uh, I mentioned the hundreds of thousands that we've had. And because, you know, more than half of our population is over the age of 65, these aren't young veterans who are doing this. So... Um, they're, they're working with it. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Um, okay, Mr. Secretary, I, I believe we have a few members that want to ask a, a second round of questions. I appreciate your indulgence. Um, I, I'll, I'll begin by asking you about testing. Um, that's one of the biggest question marks nationwide that we have uh, throughout this public health emergency is our capacity and access to testing, the confusion around it, the inconsistency of criteria available at testing sites. Um, so I wanna just have you walk us through, what are VA's current testing capabilities? Can you tell us how the testing process works? Uh, do you provide consistent access to testing across all VA facilities? Who's eligible to receive a test? Under what conditions? What are we doing as far as criteria to test VA employees? Um, can they get tested even if they're not showing symptoms? Um, I think we need the, the Clerk needs to reset our clock here. Um, how many facilities have rapid testing available on site? What is the turnaround time for those tests? Um, overall, the, the, the theme of my questions are that the feedback that I'm getting from our VSOs, from uh, a, different types of VA facilities across the country is that the testing criteria and accessibility and availability of it is quite inconsistent. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm happy to say we do have adequate testing in VA. We have, at this point, tested more than 125,000 veterans, just over 11,000 of whom have been positive. Most of those, as the Secretary referenced earlier, have recovered or in a convalescent status, more than 76%, and we're happy to see that, that high rate of recovery. Most of our veterans are also able to be monitored at home, and we are seeing, um, we are seeing a trend that as we have made testing available and as we are able to catch this illness early, that gives veterans and their families and those they encounter a better chance in being able to fight this and being able to succeed in conquering it. We also have a testing available for our employees. Any employee who is symptomatic, who is concerned that they have been exposed or requests a test is able to receive that. To your question of rapid testing, we do have that in 145 facilities. We are aware that there are specific tests that have um, been under consideration by the FDA for needing higher ac accuracy. I'm proud to say that in no spaces in VA are we relying solely on those that are under question by the FDA. In most sites, we have multiple forms of testing available, and we typically receive those results for the rapid in a couple of hours and for the standard antigen tests in about two days. Okay, um, doctor, the, I, I'm, I'm really, for 
the entire time during the pandemic have gotten reports from, that we do not have consistent access to testing based on the same criteria all the way across the VA, no matter, I mean, it, are you confident and can you go back and provide me with assurance and documentation that at every, in every vision we have a uni uniform access to testing, clear criteria across the board that both veterans and employees can understand and are you promoting and that you are promoting that access to testing? Madam Chair, we'd be happy to provide that. And yes, and to those listening today, um, we would so appreciate this group and those listening helping us carry the message that if there is a veteran concerned about the symptoms they have or needing a test, VA is here for them. We have more than adequate testing supply. We can actually conduct up to 60,000 a week and we welcome them to come and see us. Okay, I just think the messaging needs to be made consistent across all the visions so that there is a clear understanding about that. And speaking of, uh, of, of clear messaging and understanding, um, I, I, Mr. Secretary, I've had a, I, I mentioned yesterday in our conversation on the phone that I had a virtual roundtable and have been speaking with various veteran service organizations on an ongoing basis. And uh, I was concerned about that across the board, they raised issues with the disheartening lack of communication from the VA and consultation with the VSOs at the time. I know. Um, that you are having regular conversations with the VSOs, but as I mentioned yesterday, their concern is that they aren't being consulted, they're merely, merely being informed. And there's obviously quite a difference between co consultation and, uh, and feedback when you really wanna be able to make sure that, you, that they explain to you what works best for veterans. And that's been an ongoing issue at the VA. Um, we're having trouble uh, you're often getting information from you and from your, your team. It took uh, you know, uh, over a month for us to get uh, the update on your use of hydroxychloroquine and the uh, instructions also that are being sent out to, uh, to VAs across the, uh, across the country. Um, the, I realize that you're in a, uh, you're in a COVID-19 pandemic environment, but I mean, the Secretary of Defense regularly, uh, who is also a member of the task force and is obviously quite busy with, uh, with dealing with the, the military's response, holds regular press conferences, is able to communicate more consistently and effectively. So um, how can you make sure that you have a, a consistency of VA guidance and policies that are communicated, con consult with your constituent groups, particularly the VSOs, and can you commit to more regularly publicly communicating with the public and the VA community? Well, that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that's a very interesting observation. Uh, yesterday, I um, sat down with CBS News. That was the 102nd interview that I've done. Right. I know there's a difference, Mr. Secretary, between, I know you've done interviews. That's but, different than having a given But it's take. across, I want to say it's across the spectrum. It's MSNBC, it's National Public Radio, right. it's ABC. I actually raised your concerns with the VSOs yesterday, about 160 representatives on my call, which lasted over an hour, and I mentioned that I had talked to you. And I urged them uh, to use the forum and to use the time to raise the concerns that you raised with me. Uh, I'll be brutally honest with you, I can't guess, but I asked them to send to talk, um, I, I can't read, read minds, I don't mean to sound harsh, but um, I took your concerns to them yesterday and asked for exactly what you just said that they said that they wanted. Mr. Secretary, just to make sure you understand, I mean, the, you're requiring the VSOs to submit questions to you a week in advance before you talk with them. And quite frankly, it's a lot more intimidating on a group of 160 other organizations communicating with you to be the one or two that raise the issue that all of them, I, I, as someone who's on a call every week with, uh, with 233 other of my colleagues, you know, it's, it's not the easiest format right now to raise concerns. I can assure you, I had a very large group of VSOs um, represented and, uh, and have been, so, so you, they may not have wanted to tell you to your face, but I'm sure, I can assure you that they have expressed well, they couldn't the concern see it to me. Like this. Um, let, let me ask one other thing. You mentioned the Secretary of Defense. Um, 
having been the undersecretary and assistant secretary, there is a dedicated press corps at the Department of Defense. They live there. There are hundreds of them. Uh, we don't have that. Um, I do the best that I can, given the fact that ma the major publications, uh, newspapers in this country, don't have anybody dedicated to VA. It's sort of a catch-as-catch-can, which is why I've done so much radio and television um, uh, across the spectrum, but particularly with those, those venues that you would agree that most uh, people on the Republican side or yes. conservatives wouldn't use. Mr. Secretary, I, I recognize that you have done TV interviews. That is different than making yourself available and publicly communicating from a platform with a weekly or bi-weekly press conference to provide updates and also to engage in back and forth with more than just one reporter at a time. And then also the concern, I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm certain you're not questioning that I heard this feedback from the VSOs and others have as well, making sure that you consult, which is different than informing the VSOs that so they have an opportunity to give you feedback and feel like they can inform your decisions is, is a different approach than, no. you have been, than, than you have been taking. Uh, I, agree with your, I agree with your observation to the extent that it is a two-way street. Yes, it is a two-way street. But right now they only feel that the street is going one way. And, and can you commit that you will make yourself more publicly available rather than one reporter at a time to more broadly update the public about the ongoing response of the VA to the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, I don't think any VA secretary has ever had that luxury just because of the layout of the way that we are covered. Um, that's why I've had to turn to. However you might find an opportunity to do that, I'm sure that because we have such a, that you're the largest healthcare system in the country, that there would be response to by by the uh, by the press to hearing from you about the and, impact and of the I, virus and, on our and, and I know you don't want to continue this, but I also say I've made myself available from the, I think the most visible platform, in the country, the White House press room. Right, and, but not consistently, Mr. Secretary. Well, I don't think any not, of us have been because of this. Not consistently. So, so you you won't commit to more, more regularly making. Oh, I'm going to do. I I am committed to communicating in as many venues as I can. Okay. And well, I, and I, my, as my I mentioned, advice to you publicly is that perhaps you could do so on a more broad-based basis and ensure that the VSOs will also have an opportunity to provide you with feedback that they can give you before decisions are made. I want them to provide feedback. Okay. Well, I'm glad that we had a chance to, for you to confirm that publicly. And, and if you could give them a forum to do so without requiring them to submit a question a week in advance, that would probably make them feel more like there's a free-flowing... Now, now, I will also say that exchange uh, of I agree with you that logistically that's almost impossible given the con conditions we have now. But I will, um, I will return uh, to the normal process of, of having the leaders in. Uh, and I don't know that they I, told I, you I that. Don't know, Mr. Secretary, I don't know why there, it is necessary to ask them to give you questions a week in advance. I mean, you, you can certainly... You can certainly have well. There are there were 160 on the phone yesterday. Right, I, I understand, but making I, sure and, and making sure that you can if the questions come up between the week before you consult. You, you're on the phone with them or in a. I a, I commit. A, I I am things doing things happening in real time all yeah, the time during this crisis. I, I'm doing what I can as much as I can to communicate, and I and I agree with you that that more information is better. Okay, well, I would, I would ask you to go back and, uh, and review how you might be able to make sure that in more real time prior to your decisions are concluded that you're getting the kind of feedback that is effective for the constituency group that you represent. Okay, um, Ms. Bustos, uh, you're, I don't, oh, I'm sorry, Judge Carter, who is still with us. <laughs> Judge Carter, you're recognized for five minutes. Am I ready? It's on black. Uh, Judge Carter, you're uh, recognized for five minutes. Do you have any additional questions? Uh, yeah, I've got one, one little conversation I'd like to have. Now, thank you uh, for the second round. Uh, in March, Dr. Stone authorized the, the 
certified registered nurses as an ethicist full practice authority in those states which permitted it or allowed it. And it was to be a temporary authority. Uh, I'd like to know when that authority is planned to rescind that authority. I've heard some stories about an anesthesiologist with time on their hands at the VA. And this is important to me because um, I, every time I, I tried a case back in 1984, lasted about six or eight weeks, and I heard everything I ever wanted to hear about the intubation process and the, the chemical used to do that process, which was used in my case as a murder weapon, and um, the paralyzing of the of the system in order to intubate people with the adult drug, adult gag reflex. So I guess maybe I, I, I know too much about anesthesiology because of that case and and have, being someone who had, uh, was unfortunate to have adult onset asthma come on in my 50s, uh, I have to worry every time I go under about something like breathing when I come out. And uh, I, so I want the person there that should an emergency arise, they're going to be able to provide me what I need. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure the nurse and anesthetists are wonderful people, and but they're by definition not as skilled as the anesthesiologists. And uh, I think we owe our, uh, our veterans, if they're going into a situation where they're going under, that they have the very best that, that we can provide. And so I'd like to know what uh, when that will be rescinded and uh, what metrics did the VA use to determine the full practice authority uh, was warranted and was it more than just anecdotal evidence? Judge, I'll, I'll answer the second person. We were, we were in an emergency situation. Um, the original estimates that I gave to the chair in the first conversation that we had after the emergency was declared was that we would probably be looking at 200,000 uh, infected veterans. Um, we needed to find as many people as quickly as we could uh, for emergency purposes. Uh, thankfully, we've been able to hire over 10,000 people in the last five weeks on the nurse anesthetists because of the immediacy of the ventilator issue, we needed as many people who were skilled in the operation of those ventilators as we could find. And we only used uh, the CERNAs in those states, as you pointed out, uh, those states that had already authorized them to a full range of practice. Uh, it was an emergency uh, situation. I don't know when that emergency will abate um, but that, that was the parameter uh, of the decision made, and I'll let Dr. McDonald finish. Sir, to emphasize the, the Secretary's point, this was bringing us in line with industry in this moment of pandemic in those states that had already enacted this, 17 by law and 12 by executive order. That's 29 states and about 200 million Americans living in areas served by CRNAs with full practice authority. On our teams, and VA, as I mentioned earlier, has long been a leader in team-based care, including anesthesia team-based care. We needed these, these CRNAs as vital elements of our team to help give us the agility we need to serve veterans well and well across the country. And this is an element of necessary recruitment that we need for our readiness now, and we need for our readiness if indeed there is a future wave of this in the fall. So do you expect, um, when do you expect that You'll, you'll rescind this temporary uh, order that you've done, or do you expect it to make, be permanent? This is temporary, sir, and it actually automatically expires with the end of the national emergency. At that point, we'd like to come back and have a conversation about the way forward. So that is, that is actually part of the, the order that it will, expand, will end after the national emergency? 
with the end of the national emergency. Yes, sir. Hey, thank you for the information. Thank Feel you. Back. Thank you, Judge Carter. And uh, our, our last uh, member to ask questions in the second round will be Ms. Bustos. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as, as I continue to talk with veterans in our district, uh, we have mostly a, a rural district in the central, western, and northern part of the state of Illinois. And um, we, we have a great goodwill in, in the city of Peoria. And um, what they've conveyed to me is that um, while you're leveraging your virtual outreach, especially during this pandemic, and, and Mr. Secretary, you went over some of those numbers of how you've grown the, the telehealth capabilities. Um, what we're learning is that we have many veterans, and especially in rural areas where you don't have high-speed internet, um, but, but also many don't even have smartphones or you know, any kind of digital device that would lend itself to being able to have that telehealth interaction where you can, you can actually make eye contact virtually. Um, so w wondering, and I know um, Will Hurd asked this question, I was over voting, um, so I didn't uh, get to hear the answer to this, but I, I understand, uh, Mr. Secretary, that you said that um, you have a program to lend tablets to veterans. Can you talk about how you will institutionalize that? So to the veterans in our area who don't have smartphones or tablets or anything like that, what can I go home and tell them about the system that you have and then how you will institutionalize that in the VA? Yes, it is part of our general VA outreach mm -hmm. um, to expand our footprint into rural America. Uh, we've been distributing and the, the chair and the committee subcommittee provided monies for that. Uh, we're, we're sending these tablets out to veterans who are in those rural areas. Um, if they don't have one, we'll please call us and we'll do our best to get them out to them. Call the VA medical center that they use and we will work to that. Uh, it will, I, I, I'll have to get back with you on the training because I, I don't know all of the ins and outs, but it is part of a comprehensive uh, rural um, outreach that we have. So for your veterans, please call us and we will get, we will get in there. Okay, so, it, so it's literally, it, no question on the supplies. You have the supplies you need to be able to get those out. You have we, the we, funding. We are constantly expanding the number of tablets that we, we purchase. Okay, all right, very good. Doctor, anything else to, to add to, to that? To follow on to the secretary, ma'am, yes, this is part of our, as the secretary mentioned, comprehensive rural health strategy. Telehealth certainly is a piece of this, and those tablets actually come equipped with internet access um, so that these are ready-made devices to enable veterans to um, succeed in their care and engage with us. Additionally, um, under the secretary's leadership, we've engaged in a number of public-private partnerships, including with the Rural Broadband Association, to bring telehealth sites to rural areas and also offset the, the otherwise that would be cost of engaging in telehealth visits. So T-Mobile, Sprint, um, TrackPhone, Verizon actually waive the data fees when veterans are engaging with us on a video visit. Um, additionally, though, the in-person part of rural care provision is important as well. Our clinical resource hubs deliver telehealth. They also send providers to rural areas to engage veterans where they are as a necessary piece of this. And of course, that's supplemented by our community care um, engagement and availability in those areas. And do you see any impediments to this rural health program um, as we have this conversation right now as far as getting the tablets out, um, whether there's training that can take place or any issues with that, but any impediments right now as we have this conversation? We don't see any, ma'am. Right. Um, and as the secretary said, we're looking to drastically expand this and already have during the pandemic. This started long before this, but we've drastically expanded it now. And we're thankful for those partnerships, for instance, from Apple with iPads who have prioritized us in their supply chain in order to get this distribution done. Okay, that's great. Um, I, I've got a minute left, so I'm gonna squeeze in this last question. Um, Mr. Secretary, you mentioned at the start of uh, your remarks, uh, your surge hiring of about 10,000 employees. Can you talk about what kind of employees, mental health, um, uh, just kind of what is the, the layout geographic? Can you, can you go into a little bit about what those 10,000 employees are doing, their jobs, where they are, et cetera? We, uh, we have cut many corners. Uh, we have used emergency hiring authorities, but we've also eliminated many of the bureaucratic uh, barriers uh, to hiring. About those 10,000, about 3,000 are nurses. 
uh, 700 are, are doctors. We've told them that if they want to join us, they can stay in their homes, their home regions. And uh, so I don't have the breakdown across the country, uh, but it's a significant number. Do you have any? Yes, and just want to emphasize, as the Secretary said, that we've hired more than 11,000. Um, you know, earlier this month, it was actually Nurses Week, um, and we are very proud to have brought on thousands of nurses, um, hundreds of doctors, as the Secretary mentioned, respiratory therapists, the CRNAs we were mentioning earlier, these high-priority roles that we need to deliver healthcare in the team-based way that we know is so effective for this illness and for the chronic conditions that many of our veterans face. And we are planning to continue that aggressive hiring as we move forward through the summer and into the fall to maintain our, our readiness stance and make sure that we're ready for what comes. All right, very good. My time's out. I'll yield, I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bustos. Uh, that concludes this morning's hearing. Mr. Secretary, uh, Dr. Wilk, uh, Mr. Secretary, I gave you an advanced degree. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, Mr. Rachalski, Dr. McDonald, thank you for appearing at today's hearing. We clearly have covered a lot of ground, and we have a lot to do uh, in front of us to continue the response uh, to protect our veterans and the employees that work for the VA uh, against the coronavirus. I look forward to continuing to work with you all to, to do that, uh, to continuing our ongoing conversations, which have been incredibly helpful and informative and have given us a real opportunity to have the kind of give and take necessary in the midst of an ongoing crisis. Uh, thank you, uh, and on behalf thank of you. our committee, uh, and please send our appreciation to, uh, to all of those that, uh, that, that are working so hard to protect our veterans. With that, the subcommittee Thank stands you. adjourned.